Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This morning for the first conference, we're going to be speaking about Satan will try to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Father Benedict calls me every summer when the sisters need to get out their conference schedule and have generic titles for what's going to be spoken about. Father Benedict calls me out of the blue, and I consider it out of the blue, but asking me what your conference uh, talk is going to be about. And oftentimes I have to shoot from the hip and just, oh, I'll talk about this or I'll talk about that. I'll take a moment. Give me, I said, you know, give me a minute. Okay, I'll talk about this. But what prompted me to speak about uh, Satan will try to deceive in the elect is that there is an awful lot of confusion in the world today and a lot of also confusion in the church. And oftentimes when I travel, the same old confused ideas come surfacing up and as often as we've tried to answer these confusions and, and explain what the church teaches or you know, what the truth is, it seems like it always keeps surfacing. People are regurgitating, recirculating the same old errors, etc. Now, we have students here, and you know what? I love to give quizzes. I love to test kids. And so what we're going to do is we're going to test all of you for this. Minor seminarians, uh, Mount St. Michael's High School, we're going to be testing you. So if I put a star by something, that means that's going to be on a quiz, okay? And I uh, want you to do very well because we're giving you not only the questions but also the answers. And uh, with the adults uh, tonight, if you're going to eat, you have to pass the quiz too. No, just teasing. <laughs> what I wanted to speak about, first and foremost, when we think of deception, we first of all think about this topic of truth. We know that Pontius Pilate, when he was interrogating Jesus, Jesus talked about he came into the world to bear witness to the truth. And Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? Recently, after class, uh, I was about to leave and one of the high school girls asked me, she said, uh, Bishop, my brother's and college, university, and he wanted me to ask you, what is truth? Well, a key word to truth is the word conformity. And we're going to speak about this because there are three types of truth. But that's the key word, conformity. There is what we call logical truth. There is ontological truth. And there's also moral truth. But the, once again, the key word to truth is conformity. Logical truth, and that's what we're going to focus on this morning, is the conformity of the mind to reality. If I look out my window at the rectory here and I see something eating the leaves off of a tree and I see that it's a deer, I have truth. My mind is conforming to reality that that's a deer right there. Or if perhaps I'm driving my car and I see smoke coming out of the underneath my engine and the temperature gauge is all the way to the top, my mind conforms to reality my car is overheating. So we oftentimes are conforming our minds to everything around us, always verifying. And in fact, God gave us a mind, an intellect, to know the truth. We seek the truth. Then we have an example of what we call ontological truth, and that is the conformity of an object to our minds. I have 
an object that I know of, let's say, hypothetically, a piece of gold. I know what gold is. And so if I'm in Colorado in some creek with a panning dish and I'm going through a brook or a stream and I'm shaking things out and I fee see a hunk of a rock that conforms to everything that gold is, that object conforms to my mind. That's ontological truth. A thing is what it is as God made it. And then finally we have what we call moral truth. And that is the conformity of our speech to our mind, what we think we say. So these are the three types of truth. This morning we're going to focus primarily on logical truth. And like I told the students, I'm going to be putting asterisks where you're going to have to know. So one of your first questions is going to be, what is the key word when we speak of truth? So we put an asterisk here. I want you to know also how we would define logical truth, ontological truth, and moral truth. So we have four questions for your quiz tomorrow. Okay, we're going to go into now, when we think we're searching for the truth, whoa, this thing's moving here. Um, we want to speak about the different states of our mind. And for those of you who are seminarians and have attended my classes in philosophy, this is what we call criteriology. Criteriology is the study of, I'm going to move this against the stage so we don't lose it here. Criteriology is the study of certitude. How do I know that what I'm thinking is true and can I verify it? must be breaks on this thing. Hopefully that'll stop. Not sure about that one. But the states of mind are, first of all, ignorance. Ignorance is the lack of knowledge. It's a lack of knowledge in someone who should and could know. So if we Think of someone trying to practice law, and he's not going to, you know, uh, get to get his law degree. He he's ignorant of what he's doing. If someone's trying to fix a car and he's never gone into mechanics and doesn't know what he's doing, he's he's ignorant. But ignorance is a lack of knowledge in someone that sh could and should know. Then we have what we call doubt. Doubt is what we call a suspension of judgment. I don't know. I'm not sure. I really don't have any opinion on this because I, I can't make a decision. That's a doubt. Then we have what we call opinion. Opinion is a hesitating ascent of the mind. You think, I believe it's this way, I believe it's that way, but I might be wrong. I'm not sure. But then we get to what we call certitude. Certitude is the unhesitating ascent of the mind. We say it is this or it is that or it is not this or it's not that. It's cut and dry. That is certitude. We are sure, we're certain, we're without any doubt, and without any hesitation. This is the way it is. Now, there's several different types of certitude. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Okay, that's five, six, seven, eight. Is anybody keeping up with the notes? Maybe, maybe not. That's okay. We're going to get into the different types of certitude and give an example of them. And then we're going to give you these examples of how we apply this in theology and in everyday life and also with regard to the different types of opinions and confusions out there. There are four different types of certitude. So we're going to write certitude, and we're going to write down the first one is called purely subjective. 
purely subjective certitude is not certitude at all. Purely subjective means merely in the mind. People at one time believed that the world was flat, a flat earth. Was it based on anything? No. They just never could see the curvature of the earth, so they felt that if you went too far, you'd fall off. Purely subjective. Uh, I like to tell this story because uh, I like to tell stories. But uh, I live in the south side of Chicago and uh, rough neighborhood. We had a Doberman Pinscher. Uh, but I used to hear stories of my parents and neighbors talking about break-ins because we've had some of that go on. And we had in the, our home a full basement. But my father was, you know, furnishing it and getting it, you know, completed, etc. But it was still in the works, so it was kind of dark out there. So when you turn on the light, you go down the stairs, it only was a light right to the bottom of the stairway. You'd have to walk all the way into the basement and turn the light on by a pole chain. And I was always afraid of the basement, especially at nighttime. You know, maybe somebody broke in there, and maybe there's a robber there, and maybe going to kill me, and whatever else. So, I mean, you know, I hear these stories in a little kid. So we had an extra refrigerator downstairs, and my mother said, we ran out of milk, go downstairs, go get another gallon of milk. And I, Mom, there could be somebody down there that might kill me. She said, there's nobody down there, just go get the milk. You know, and, and my mind is racing, like, oh, I know there's somebody down there, etc. So... I go down the stairs, I turn the light, go down the stairs, and the light's just at the, right at the bottom of the stairway, and the refrigerator is way over there, and you got this dark, scary basement all the way down. And my mind is, I know there's somebody there. He's probably looking at me right now. He's right about to grab me. So I go to the refrigerator, and I'm turning my back. So you, know, you never turn your back on the back, you know, the dark basement. I open up the refrigerator door, and somebody had a bag on top of the refrigerator. That bag hit me in the head. I mean, just as I grabbed the, it was a gallon, glass gallon milk. I screamed, dropped the gallon, fortunately didn't break it, and the cap was stone, so I didn't spill anything. And I ran up the stairs and said, somebody just threw something at me, Mom. I knew there was somebody down there. <laughs> so my father hears the scream and hears the bang and hears me yelling. And he's like, what's going on? So I said, there's somebody down there. So my dad gets a pistol. My brother, who lives in Coeur d'Alene, Wayne, he got a fork. <laughs> they searched the whole basement. There was nobody down there. But my brother had to make the most of this, so he takes the bag with the fork. He says, you leave my little brother alone. You understand that? <laughs> <laughs> Felt like a complete idiot. Fool. But that's purely subjective. Just completely in the mind. Not based on reality. Okay. Then we have an example of what we call practical certitude. Practical is just for everyday living. This morning, when you ate breakfast, how many of you had any fear that you would get poisoned by the sisters? <laughs> like, I'm going to be last in line if somebody hits the floor and starts, you know, <laughs> having a some type of a spasm or something. I'm not eating this breakfast. I mean, you have a practical certitude that someone's not going to kill you. I mean, especially people you trust. I mean, are you 100% sure of that? Absolutely, positively certain? Not necessarily. But, I mean, you're relatively certain. And, and you know what? If you went on life doubting everything and, and not having certitude, I mean, when you sat in the chair this morning, you had practical certitude the chair wasn't going to collapse. So we do many things practically, but do we absolutely positively know for certain? Not necessarily. How many times we go over bridges and we think bridges are not going to collapse? But I can't tell you how many times I've gone over Interstate 35W and 35E in Minneapolis-St. Paul, and sure enough, how many years ago was that? The bridge cracked and it broke down, remember? I mean, you kind of know a bridge is not going to collapse, but you don't know. So... After that, I t when I was driving students, I'd tell them, you know, sometimes these bridges collapse. So I get to the bridge and I'd speed up just to go a little bit faster. <laughs> we get to the other side, we made it, you know. So that's practical certitude. Then we have respective certitude. Respective certitude is based on authority. Somebody that I trust said so, and I am certain because 
they're not going to lie to me. So really, respect of certitude could be a child to its parents. If mom and dad said so, it's right, I'm sure. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And then we also have, and this is the most important of the certitudes, and it's called, I'm going to write it over here a little bit higher up, it's called formal certitude. Certitude as such. This is certitude that is unhesitating assent based on objective evidence. Now I'm going to give you a couple of examples of this because it's important for us as we go further in what we're about to say about how Satan is going to try to deceive even if possible the elect. We have an example, we give an example of the flat earth. But I could give many, many examples in the area of theology. You have, for example, when Jesus, our divine Savior, came down from heaven and became man, and when he began his public life, he walked amongst men. And the thing that just absolutely can boggle our minds is he worked miracles. A man was born blind, and he was given his sight by Jesus. A man was crippled, and Jesus commanded him, take up your bed and walk home. Lepers were cleansed. People were dead and came back to life. And yet, the Pharisees rejected Jesus. The scribes rejected Jesus. Their rejection of Christ was purely subjective, in the head. If they would have been objective about their evidence, as that blind man who was born blind from birth, he was called in and questioned, who cured you? The man named Jesus. How did he do it? We well, took some mud or clay and he put it under my eyes. He said, go wash and I wash and I see. How did he do it? Well, it must be a miracle. No, it wasn't a miracle. That man's a sinner. And what did the man born blind say? Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But he says, but it's never been heard from the beginning of the world that a man was born blind and he can get his sight back. So they said, uh, go get your parents. His parents come in. And now they were afraid. They said, this is your son. Yes. Was he born blind? Yes. How does he see? I don't know. Ask him. He's old enough. They didn't want to answer because they were afraid of getting kicked out of the synagogue. So they asked him again, how do you see? He said, I already told you. He said, will you also be his disciples? Oh, that was not the question they asked the Pharisees and scribes. They said, you were born in sin and, and you're a sinner and you know they, they kicked him out. Jesus heard that this man had been expelled from the synagogue and when Jesus found him, he came to Jesus and Jesus asked him, do you believe in the Son of God? He said, Yea, Lord, who is he? He says, I'm speaking to you. And he fell down and he, and he worshipped him. He says, I believe. Now, the beautiful thing I like to say about our faith is this. Better put some asterisks on the board before I forget. As nine, I think, ten, eleven, and twelve. Okay, the beautiful thing about our faith is this. Our faith is based on objective evidence. Now, sometimes people have the mistaken notion that faith is just some blind, oh, I believe in this, I believe in that, and it can't be proved, there's no evidence, etc. That is not the way of God. If God is going to reveal something to us, he's going to make it very clear that this is coming from him. And so what is the surest signs, what is the surest proof of the divine origin of our religion? that God is revealing something to us. The surest signs are miracles and prophecies. And I'm going to briefly, i got a lot to speak about, so I'm going to briefly touch upon these things. Miracles, these are supernatural events beyond the power of any man. Prophecies, the foretelling of future events, impossible for anyone to... to, to um, to know. And when we look at divine revelation, we see the surest signs. These signs are sufficient for all men for all time. When we think of just today, in this day and age, how would you talk to the average Joe or average Jane on the street uh, that, how, that Christ was indeed all he claimed to be? First and foremost, what year is it? 2013. All of history is focused on the birth of Christ. That's the focal point. His life is the center of all history. Number two, the Gospels were preached 
by the apostles. They preached about the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, the miracles he worked. The people that they were speaking to were contemporaneous with the times they, they lived at those times. They could easily verify, did those things happen or did they not happen? And the reality is, the apostles preached and no one ever denounced them as liars, frauds, or they made this all up. You can't lie about this. If someone's saying, this man was raised from the dead, Lazarus was raised from the dead by, in Bethany, <clears throat> it was done even in front of the enemies of Jesus. You could go to Bethany, you could talk to people, and you could verify, did these things happen? But the miracles of Christ were so public, so multiple, so widespread throughout all the lands, so well known were they, it's amazing, when we read, even Jesus' enemies dare not deny that he worked those miracles. Why? <clears throat> because they were too public. It was impossible to deny the reality of them. In fact, the Talmud, these are the writings of the ancient Jews, and they speak about Christ. And of all the horrible things they say about Jesus and Mary, blasphemous things, name-calling, and all these horrible things, accusations, etc., the one thing they don't say, which would have been their strongest argument against Christ, they don't say that he never worked those miracles. That would have been the best argument. Oh, it's all made up. He never did those things. But they didn't use those arguments because they couldn't use those arguments because everybody knew those miracles took place. Too, they were too public, too many, and it was impossible to deny. Now, another thing, too, is with regard to the prophecies. And we've spoken about this in past conferences, but I am fascinated, absolutely possibly fascinated, when you see the prophecies, whether they're from the Psalms, or they go all the way back to the book of Genesis, or they're talking about Isaiah or Jeremiah, or you look at the, the prophets writing at different times, different places, and it all converges, all perfectly fulfilled by Christ. That is amazing. Absolutely, positively amazing. Somebody worked on the probability that prophecies made hundreds and thousands of years before the coming of Christ, all coming and fulfilled in one person, the probability is astronomical. It's, it's literally impossible. There's no way that these men at different times and different places could all speak about one person, and that were per one person, you know, over a course of 4,000 years, all these prophecies, and that one person perfectly fulfills the location, the time, the circumstances, and all these other minute, detailed foretellings or prophecies, you know, these future events that perfectly were fulfilled by Christ. St. Augustine has something very important to say, and I'd like to just briefly talk about that, and that is this. Why is it that the Jews today, God has tolerated them? I mean, they denounced Jesus before Pilate. They called for his crucifixion. They said, his blood be upon us and upon our children. And the Jews have been persecuted for the last 2,000 years. Their temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., never to be rebuilt. They've been persecuted ever since. But St. Augustine says the Jews exist today because they bear witness to the Old Testament. The Old Testament so clearly points to Jesus as the Messiah that pagans might make the accusation, no, you Christians made up that, that book, that Old Testament. And, and, and that's all, you know, you all wrote those things down after the life of Christ to say, look at how it was verified in Christ. They can't use that argument because the Jews today reject Jesus, and yet they still uphold and verify the Old Testament. Now, we wanted to speak about these things very briefly just to kind of lay down some uh, practical uh, points that we're going to speak about. So we're talking about certitude. That's what we want to achieve in life is certitude, especially in the area of religion. Now, I was just going to say, very briefly, oh, one of the things I should have asked us there, what are the surest signs of the divine origin of the Christian religion? Miracles and prophecies. So there's no asterisk there, but you've got to know that one. And be, believe you me, I've done this in my sleep. So if you don't get all the notes or if somebody's not copying down the questions, when I'm flying out, when I get to Minneapolis, St. Paul, I'm going to call back, make sure one of your teachers has these questions here. So it won't be forgotten. I'm going to give you some examples of this issue of certitude. We talked about the, the, the scribes and Pharisees rejecting Jesus as the Messiah, even though our Lord worked miracles. We can get into so many different aspects, but one aspect is Protestantism. 
what's absolutely positively amazing for many Protestants today, not saying all, but many, Protestants say that they are the true church of Christ. And that is simply, purely subjective, not based on reality. And how is that? Well, we can cover com- a couple of examples. First of all, the Protestants jump from, let's say, 2013, that they're the Church of Christ. They jump back to the Bible and from the Bible to Christ. And they're very cozy about the fact that they're the true Church of Christ and they follow the Bible and it's the Bible only. But everything else that went in between, the history of the church that Christ founded, they completely, absolutely, positively ignore everything. So, if you talk about, to a Protestant, what about the early Christian writers? Who were they? The fathers of the church. When we read their writings, we see that they were Catholic. They speak about the papacy. They speak about the holy sacrifice of the Mass, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, forgiving his sins by priests. They talk about bishops, priests, deacons, subdeacons, all the ranks that we have in the Catholic Church, honoring the Blessed Virgin Mary, prayers for the dead because of purgatory. You can go through the whole gamut. The early Christian writers show that the early Christians were Catholic. The second thing is you go to the catacombs. Archaeologically, when we look at the catacombs, we find that the early Christians, when they gather together, they gather together for Mass, for the sacrifice of the Mass. Not only the catacombs show us about the Mass and the seven sacraments and the inscriptions on the catacombs, but the catacombs were the burial places of the popes, of bishops, and the early Christian martyrs. And the amazing thing in the catacombs of St. Calixtus is those are the popes that we know historically were the popes at that time. So we not only have written accounts of of them, but we also have the concrete evidence that they were buried in these places. I mean, their tombs with their names and stuff are still down there. Now they've been taken out of the catacombs into different churches around Rome. But but the point is, is that if you look at the catacombs, the evidence is, the objective evidence is, they were Christians, they were Catholics. And not only that, but the early Christians, when we look at uh, their defense of of the faith, like Justin Martyr or Ignatius of Antioch, these men are the early, early, early church. St. Justin Martyr, he defended the faith. He was an apologist. Many things that we as Catholics believe are very clearly taught by him, especially when you read Justin Martyr, about his speaking of the Blessed Virgin Mary. From his writings, we can certainly conclude the Immaculate Conception. Uh, Way back, and when did Justin Martyr, uh, I think he was in the year 150. But we go a little bit further back. We can go to uh, uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch. He called the Church of Christ the Catholic Church. He goes back to 107. The more you study the early Christian writing, the more you see they were Catholic. But then we get into the councils of the church. We have the Council of Nicaea. Council of Nicaea was in 325 A.D. The Pope at the time who had overseen the council by his delegates was Pope St. Sylvester. Pope St. Sylvester was very, very old. And in this council, they came up with the elaborated, more elaborated Apostles' Creed about Jesus. God of God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made of one substance of the Father. And in this Nicene Creed, I believe in one holy Catholic apostolic church. You ask a Protestant, what about the Council of Nicaea? They really want to talk about it. What about the Council of Ephesus in 431. And the Council of Ephesus, once again, was treating, uh, the Council of Nicaea, we go back to Nicaea, 
was refuting Arius, who denied the divinity of Christ. Council of Ephesus was especially condemning Nestorius, who believed that Jesus was two different people. God descended into this man called Jesus, and there are two different people there. That's not what Scripture tells us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh. Jesus was one person with two natures. It was at the Council of Ephesus also that Mary was called Theotokos, the mother of God. Who was the Pope at the Council of Ephesus? Pope St. Celestine, the same Pope who sent St. Patrick up to Ireland. You know, when you get into the history of the church, early history of the church, the Protestants are, who jump from 2013, the Bible, the Christ, they have no continuity there. We can pinpoint the Protestants came in 1517, with Luther, an ex-priest. That was the Lutherans. The Anglicans came in 1534 when Henry VIII, Catholic king, who has had the title Defender of the Faith, when, when Henry VIII couldn't get a divorce and remarriage, he said, I'm the head of the church. But my point is, is this. For the Protestants, whether it be Lutheran or whether it be Anglican or whoever they might be, we can date historically and not only we as Catholics, but even secular history dates <clears throat> these dates. They did not exist <clears throat> before these dates. The Protestants did not exist. Martin Luther was the first one to protest the faith, protest the teachings of the church. So this, this is all purely subjective, not based on objective evidence, it's, that is not certain. They might feel like they're the Church of Christ. They might think it in their minds, but it's not real. It's not there. doesn't exist. Now, <clears throat> we're talking to the choir. All of you know these things. <clears throat> However, I was going to say, just to give you a quick rundown too, the beautiful thing about our Catholic faith is, is this. This thing's not racing very well, but we'll try. How do I know <clears throat> that the Catholic Church is the true Church of Christ? Many, many different ways, but we could take, for example, the papacy. Matthew 16, 18. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. I know the Protestants want to go on and on and on about, no, no, Jesus wasn't talking about Peter he was talking about himself as the rock and upon him he was going to build his church. No, 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 no. Look at the quote. What do we see in the quote there? Jesus says, asked the question, whom do men say that I am? John the Baptist, Elias, one of the prophets. But he says, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter speaks up and says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says to him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to thee, but my Father in heaven, I say to thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail. And whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. You can't get around that quote. Jesus uses Simon Barjona, his original name. And we go to John 1.42. We find that Jesus, when he sees Peter, he says, Simon Barjona, thou shalt be called Kephas. And in Hebrew, Kephas is rock. So literally, when Jesus is speaking to Peter, he says, Thou art Kephas, and upon Kephas I build my church. Now that we can argue back and forth with Protestants about this, that, and everything else. Bottom line is this. What's the reality? St. Peter went to Rome, and St. Peter had successors. And the interesting thing about these successors is they rule the church. We can go back to the early uh, accounts that are st they still have them available, the archives in the Vatican of early decisions made by the Pope. And one of them, Pope Clement I, he died 90 AD, one of the successes of St. Peter, a controversy arose amongst the Corinthians. The Corinthians could have easily gone to St. John the Evangelist, one of the apostles, but no, they went to the Pope, Pope Clement I, to decide that. The issue with regard to Easter come up, you know, maybe a hundred or so years later. When do you celebrate Easter? 
and the popes authoritatively determine the date of Easter. This is a matter of history. And the Protestants have no answer to these things. But my other point is, is this. When we read, we can just go, we can, Scripture points to the Catholic Church, the, uh, what we call tradition, those truths handed down by word of mouth, but we find the tradition, the liturgies, early liturgies of the church, the writings of the early fathers of the church, etc. We have the history. But the main thing we have is what, the continuity. There's this unbroken chain of belief. Same truths, same doctrine being taught year after year after year after year. That's why when we say, when we say the church is one, Holy Catholic Apostolic, it's one in its, in its belief, it's one in its worship, and it's one in its authority. And that for over 2,000 years, or nearly 2,000 years. There's this continuity from Christ all the way through. Protestants can't point to any of that as continuity. So when they jump from themselves to the Bible, the Christ, purely subjective. Okay, I didn't want to spend too much time on this because we want to get right to the meat of the matter. The meat of the matter is, as Catholics today, things are very, very confusing. And so what we like to do is to cover some things that would be very well for you to know in your trying to live and practice your faith and being sure that what you're doing is correct. Now, we're trying to give you a complete overview. Uh, what's interesting is uh, at the seminary in Omaha, we have we teach philosophy for the first two years. There's different branches of philosophy. There's dialectics, criteriology, cosmology, the Odyssey, ontology, uh, all these different ologies. Okay, and what's interesting is the textbooks we use. They presuppose or they, the, the author writes the Monsignor Paul Glenn, who taught at St. Charles Seminary in Columbus, Ohio, a PhD, he presupposed that you've never read any of his other books. So each book he covers very thoroughly. So if this is the one and only book you're picking up, you're going to understand the whole gist of it. But the point to be made is that, and what we're going to speak about this morning, it's important for us to do a quick review about what happened in 1962 to 65. And we're going to try to be very, very in the concrete objective. We know that Vatican Council II, 1962 to 65, ushered in what they called a reform. But it's important for us to look at the reality of what were those significant reforms that were so horrendous and so uh, drastic. First and foremost, we've spoken about this before, is false ecumenism. And I always like to get things down as nitty-gritty as I can so that even the average little kid out there is going to say, I don't understand what he said. What is false ecumenism? It's based on religious indifferentism. The idea that it doesn't matter what religion you believe. All religions are more or less good and praiseworthy. They're all okay. All, they all worship God. It's all fine. Don't worry about it. Don't get, don't get so upset and burned out, you know, bent out of shape. But we know that the Catholic Church has always taught that there is one true religion. And that has been revealed through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. God came down from heaven, became man, worked miracles, fulfilled the prophecies, proclaimed that he was the Son of God, died on the cross, instituted a church, founded a church, instituted the seven sacraments. And he was very clear about one thing. And we look at scripture, Jesus commands his apostles, this is Matthew 28, 19, teach all nations. What? All things whatsoever I commanded you. 
Okay, that's the object of the church. And in fact, some say that when we talk about the church being Catholic, it's because Christ commanded the church to teach all nations all things whatsoever he commanded, and he will be with the church all days. The word in Greek, katholikos, means all or universal. There's only one church that's taught all nations, all things, and directly goes back to Christ as the Catholic Church. And we look at our Lord's quote in Mark 16:16. 16, 16, Jesus said, He who is baptized and believes will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through Jesus. We cannot be indifferent to these things. The Catholic Church has condemned religious indifferentism explicitly. And we can go through Pope Eugene IV and Cantate Domino, uh, Pope Boniface VIII and Unam Sanctum. We can look at the syllabus of error of Pope Pius IX. We can look at especially Pope Pius XI, Mortalium Animos, condemns religious indifferentism. And religious, from a religious indifferentism comes the erroneous belief that we need to, all religions need to get together and worship together and share the truth with each other. That's especially condemned. There's only one religion revealed by God through Jesus Christ, and one and only. Now, what did Vatican II come out and say? Well, praise the Hindus. The Hindus are making a loving, trusting flight toward God. Praise the Buddhists who don't even believe in God. They can attain supreme enlightenment. Praise the Muslims. Praise all the religions of the world. The Catholic Church looks with esteem upon the Muslims. The Catholic Church rejects nothing that is good and holy in these other religions. She exhorts her children to acknowledge, preserve, and promote the good that's in these other religions. Is there any talk about converting them? No, absolutely, positively not. You don't want to convert them. Keep them where they're at. That is going in a completely wrong direction. Those are things the Catholic Church has condemned explicitly in the past. But you know, this is where we need to be objective. We need to look at the evidence and say, what does the evidence show? Just because a man lives in the Vatican and he wears a white cassock and everyone calls him Holy Father does not mean he's the Pope. Purely subjective. If this man is publicly worshiping with other religions and acknowledging the prayers of other religions, and they're calling for these Assisi meetings where they're saying, you come to our churches in Assisi, pray to your false gods for world peace. They're saying your prayers have value, that your false gods are going to bring about world peace. Now, bottom line is this. What is this cur very clearly against? It's against the first commandment. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Okay? It's also against, and, and when we think of the canon laws of the church in 1917, I'll give you a quick history. St. Pius X began what was called the codification of the church's laws, and it was completed by Pope Benedict XV. And he promulgated it in 1917, and it became effective in 1918. There are 2,414 canons. But someone, someone might say, well, where in the world was the church? We had to wait 1,900 some years before they got a, a code of canon law? Well, it's like this. There are some 260 popes. There were 20 ecumenical councils. There were so many different sources of law. There were so many different areas that you would have to look to for knowing what the laws of the church are. Many of them, you know, coming right from divine law, uh, apostolic, you know, laws from the apostles, etc., etc. Pope St. Pius X realized the study of canon law is very onerous, very difficult. I mean, you got so many sources, so many references. We need to codify things. Some of the laws over the last, you know, since the church had been founded, some of the laws became obsolete. And we don't, we don't need them on the books anymore. One example, uh, Council of Chalcedon said that when a bishop goes to visit a parish, he should not bring any more than 20 horses. I mean, we don't need that law anymore, you know. I bring my car, I fly in, somebody picks me up. I don't have to worry about bringing horses. And he can't bring his hunting dogs either. Hmm. 
My dog doesn't hunt, so don't worry about that. But the point is that a, a reform of the laws of the church was needed so those that were obsolete would be off the books and just bring it into one volume. And that's what St. Pius X began and it was completed by Pope Benedict the Fifteenth. Now among the canons we like to draw your attention to is Canon 1258. Canon 1258 forbids Catholics to actively worship with non-Catholics. Why? Because as it says in the Catechism and in Moral Theology, if you worship with other religions, if you worship with other churches, you're recognizing you know, these churches that were not founded by Christ, these religions that were not revealed by God, you're giving acknowledgement to them. Someone who breaks this canon 1258 is under suspicion of heresy and if after six months he doesn't clear it up, canon 2316 says he's to be considered a heretic. So we don't want to get into that yet, but we have the very clear teachings of the church that Christ is the, the way, the truth, and the life. Christ founded one church, and our Lord said to his apostles, to his you know, the apostles, go teach all nations, and that if they don't believe, they will be condemned. So we have this very clear break in 1962 to 65. Vatican II brings about what we call false ecumenism. What's very, very clever, and, and you'd have to read it to know, and to me, when you read the documents of Vatican II, so cleverly were they written that it's, it's diabolic, it's satanic. And it verifies what we chose as our title for this conference, Satan will try to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So cleverly did they write these things. Now, I like to give you an example of what they, how they wrote it, especially on ecumenism, when it gets down to the nitty-gritty. They said that, first of all, ecumenism, not practiced indiscriminately. So you know what? People look at that and say, hey, it's a bad interpretation of Vatican II. Say, they said don't practice it indiscriminately. Okay, it says it has to, as a principle, it depends on principle, and one of the principles has to show the unity in the church. And it has to be a means of, this is the other principle, it has to be a sharing of graces. They don't say a sharing on whose part. Are Catholics getting graces from the non-Catholics or is the Catholics giving the graces? Of them? You know, they don't say where those graces, who's, who's getting them, who's not getting them. It could lead you to believe that, you know, Catholics are getting graces from the non-Catholics and vice versa. Sharing of graces. Then it says, because of the first principle, because ecumenism must manifest unity of church, and this is difficult, it almost always rules out ecumenism. But, the needed graces recommends it. Now, i like to give a, a quick example. In the Old Testament, God made a covenant with his people. And as long as God's chosen people follow that covenant, that agreement, it was like a marriage pact. God's chosen people worshipped the true God, and the true God protected and defended and gave victory to his chosen people. When the chosen people fell into idolatry and worship of other gods, it was like spiritual adultery. Okay? The Catholic Church is the immaculate spouse of Christ. Spouse of Christ. The faithful spouse of Christ. And what happens when Catholics recommending what Vatican II said the needed grace recommends it. Go ahead and worship with these other religions for the sharing of graces, even though this is a principle and this, this principle rules out ecumenism, but just go ahead and do it anyway. What it is is spiritual adultery. Now, we're going to get into it after, in the second part of this talk about what some of the scripture commentators talk about in the apocalypse, about the great harlot. And this is the point to be made. When these 
Vatican II hierarchy worship with these other religions and participate in these, this false worship, literally participate in this false worship, they are committing spiritual adultery. Now, we're going to get into another aspect very briefly coming up with regard to the Pope. Some people, he's a Pope, he can do what he wants. No, we're talking about divine law, not, not man-made law, God's law. What's the Pope's duty and what are the bishops' duty? To fulfill Christ's command, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. If a man gets up and says he's the Pope, but he's, he's telling you, go ahead and break the first commandment and don't worry about moral theology. Moral theology says it's a sin to worship other religions, but you go ahead and do it anyway. But you know, really, this was just the camel's nose in the tent. They made it sound like, don't do it indiscriminately. It has to manifest the unity of the church. And it also has to means sharing of means of grace. So unity kind of rolls it all out, but go ahead and do it anyway because we need a sharing of the grace. So, I mean, hey, I thought this depended on principles and you're supposed to abide by these principles. So it sounded like, you know, they were trying to be really, really careful about this. But as soon as they gave just a little inch, the whole camel came into the tent. And, and now people don't even, don't even have any qualm if the, if the supposed pope is worshiping with this religion or that religion or recognizing all religions. Not a problem. But it all began by that little break in the faith. And this is where Pope Leo XIII in Satis Cognitum, uh, I, I have it over here, he says, there's nothing more dangerous there's nothing more dangerous than those heretics who admit of most of the doctrines, but like with a drop of poison, poison and destroy the true faith by just a little drop. And that's all they needed. Let's just talk about a sharing of grace. Doesn't that sound nice? We, should need, we need to share graces. <clears throat> so this idea of sharing graces means that the heck with the unity of the church, the heck with you know, this idea of not worshiping with other religions, that's against the first commandment. Of, Don't worry about that because it's the sharing of graces, etc. And that's how this all began. It, it, it would be like this. Maybe it's not a perfect analogy, but if you told your, your, your children, your young adult children, you may not have any type of extramarital affair with anyone before you get married, but... If it's necessary on occasion, you go ahead and do it. I mean, there's no compromise. None. Zero. Nada. No excuse. Etc. But you see, once you say you can do it once or you can do it sometimes, don't do it indiscriminately. And, but, you, you know, all those, those ambiguous warnings mean nothing. Once you break the principle, then it's just everything and anything goes. So wanted to lay this as a one of the things... Uh, that Vatican II compromised uh, and broke with the faith. The other one is religious liberty, that man has the right to worship God any way he wants. That of all the issues of Vatican II, that was the most uh, controversial. And how is it so controversial? Because it was condemned explicitly. There were conservative cardinals and bishops saying, how can we be teaching this now? when it was condemned a hundred years ago in the syllabus of error by Pius IX. We are saying this is the teaching of the church of something that was condemned back in you know, 1863. And in 1965, we're saying this is it. Excuse me, it was 1864. A syllabus of error came out and 101 years later, they come out with uh, religious liberty, dignitatis humanae. I'd like to show you how careful and clever they were about this. And I know we're covering a lot of material very quickly. Uh, we haven't put any stars on the board. Darn it. Well, we'll, we'll put something up there. Don't worry. We don't want to. It's for the children. We don't want to leave anything out for the children. Religious liberty. What was the issue? Very cleverly. They began by saying man is free from coercion. You can't force somebody to become a Catholic. And now we all accept that. You can't put a gun on somebody's head and be baptized. You can't do that. 
So man's free from coercion, but they went from free from, they very cleverly and this very subtly go into man is free to, but this free to worship any way he wants. And the bigger problem is this, that this is a natural right of man. God-given right for man to worship God any way he wants. And no one is to restrict that right to worship any way he wants. So what happened after 1965 with Dignitati Sumane? Catholic countries, especially those who had concordats with Rome, they had to allow the public proselytizing within their countries. Spain is a great example. Spain in 1950s said that anyone moving to Spain who does not practice Catholicism will not be uh, disturbed from the private, you know, from the private practice of their religion. Private practice of religion, but only Catholicism has the the freedom of public, um, you know, promulgation and proselytization. After Vatican II, this is a Catholic country. Vatican II says because of Dignitatis Humanae, we change it, and everyone now has the right to proselytize and whatever they want. Protestants came in. And what followed? Divorce, birth control, abortion, homosexuality. Spain is not anymore a Catholic country. Same thing happened in the Catholic countries down in South America. It's because error was given the public stage, so to speak. The, and, and, and unfortunately, we have a problem, especially when it comes to what was probably, you know, before this condemned. In a Catholic country, the Catholic country would say, this is a Catholic country. The majority of people are Catholic. If, you don't, if you're not a Catholic, that's up to you. But you do not have the, have the right to start proselytizing and trying to spread your errors. And this is what leads to uh, pluralism. All religions are manifested in society. It leads to confusion and all the other things. Now what's amazing is what the Muslims couldn't do, the Moors in Spain... And what the communists couldn't do in Spain, the Vatican II brought Spain down as a Catholic country. They went through all sorts of battles against the Moors, the Muslims, for hundreds and hundreds of years and fought the communists. And it was Vatican II that brought down these Catholic countries. Uh, and you know, this leads me to another thing too, and it is this. Uh, after the second part of this conference, I would like to read from Cardinal Manning. He was the cardinal who was present and supported papal infallibility at Vatican Council I in 1870. He wrote a book called The Pope and the Antichrist. And he talks about how the countries of Europe will fall, and as a prelude to, to Antichrist, they will fall from Catholicism. Today, uh, just I don't want to forget this as a side note, if you look at the birth rate of these quote-unquote Catholic countries, Spain, France, Italy, Germany, the birth rate is under 2. So it's like 1.6, 1.3, 1.7. And it's a matter of fact that no culture can sustain itself within so many years they'll cease to exist. Now, on the other hand, because of immigration, the Muslims are having 8, 9, 10 children, and in a very short amount of time, those countries are no longer going to be Catholic, they're going to be Muslim. Uh, when I was in this is about maybe 10 years ago, I was in France for confirmation. And afterward, uh, this fellow was telling me, he said, Bishop, you go around to some of the places in France, you're not going to know whether you're in France or you're in Iran or Iraq. There's so many Muslims there. He says it's absolutely, positively incredible. And the other thing that's an interesting point is, is that the Muslims are wanting to practice Sharia law. They have multiple wives, the marriage of young girls, uh, all these different things uh, right in these countries and are becoming more and more of a voice. There was a, a father, Ru Ruiz, uh, from, uh, he's living in Spain now. He's a brother of one of the priests, the Carmelites down in Guadalajara. And he was saying that he was walking from his church to the rectory. He met a, young, a group of young Muslims and they said, when we get in the majority, we're going to kill people like you. So, it's a very, a very much of a definite threat. And I'd like to say one other thing too. This is not to get on a big tangent, 
But I was listening uh, when I was driving uh, for my third Mass on Sunday, and there was a debate going on between this uh, former Muslim woman. Her name is Gabrielle. Uh, she gives lectures around the country about the dangers of Islam, about you know the problems with uh, the Muslims. And she was talking to an iman, one of these you know leaders of the mosque, and they were really going at it. I mean, very, both were very, very energetic and emotional and very convincing. The iman was saying, Gabriel, you don't know what you're talking about. Islam is a very peace-loving religion and, and you're just exaggerating and misinterpreting and that's the problem is you people misinterpret. She says, Iman, let's get real. She says, let me start quoting from the Quran. Let's, can we talk about the Quran? What about this chapter? What that verse? This book? You know, she's like reading, reading off about attack your, your infidels and do this and do that. And she says, how do you interpret that? Iman, give me an interpretation of this. Come on, come on. She said, you know, not everyone's a terrorist out there, but the religion promotes converting by the sword. And this Gabriel, I remember I was uh, taking Father Brennan's place up in uh, Minnesota and the St. Cloud newspaper had, this Gabriel was going to be giving a talk in the St. Cloud area. The big protest. So we don't want her here and you know we don't want her around, etc., etc. Uh, but the, the, but my, my point is, is this. Vatican II said the church looks with esteem upon the Muslims. Church looks with the same upon the Muslims. And this is the problem with Vatican II. They are recognizing all the religions of the world. Now I do have, and I'm going to check it down here, I do have a, um, a public address that John Paul II gave in 1999. It was published in the, church, uh, the Pope Speaks, Our Sunday Visitors, a Novus Ordo national you know, newspaper. And in that magazine, or that newspaper, in his address... And that part of the Pope speaks. John Paul II said, he's talking about religions and other religions, and he talks about Vatican II, quoting always faithfully from Vatican II. He said that, you know, the leaders and the founders of the religions of the world were, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was actively working with them, and they formulated their doctrines, their teachings, their beliefs, etc., with the cooperation of the Holy Spirit. And this is where the religions of the world, this is their origin. And that the Holy Spirit is present and active in all the religions of the world. That is absolutely mind-boggling. Hearing that, you would say, well, what about the first commandment? Maybe just erase that first commandment. Don't talk about the Ten Commandments. Let's talk about the Nine Commandments. Let's skip the first one because there's, no there's more, no more false gods. And that is crazy, preposterous, and etc., etc. So, you know, I, I wanted to lay this as a groundwork because we want to get into the confusion. But I like to do this. You know, so it's not just hear, hear me, yep, 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 or yada, yada, yada. Uh, I would like to know, we'll stop for a second, uh, are there any questions about anything I've said so far before we go on? Anybody have any questions? Be happy to hear, and if you do, I'll repeat the questions so it's on the tape here. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And, and this is the point. That's a good point. Uh, it has, and this is a part of the confusion. There's a lot of different opinions about the papacy and the pope and whether he's the pope and whether he can be a heretic and be a pope at the same time and we're going to get into all to that. But what's interesting is mm -hmm. that there are some who say that nowhere in canon law does it talk about um, if the pope falls into heresy, manifest heresy, that he loses the papacy. Now, there is a, a bull, papal bull, cum ex apostolatus, and this was Pope Paul IV in 1559. He says that if if someone's a heretic and gets elected pope, the election's completely invalid. There's no way it can become valid, etc. They have no position, no office, etc. There's also see Papa of Pope Innocent 
Pope Innocent the uh, the third, and he says if the Pope becomes a heretic, he ceases to be the Pope. Now, interestingly, people say, well, those are just laws, and they're not found in canon law, so that don't bind anymore. Well, first of all, they're speaking about something that is a matter of divine law, and secondly, there is a canon. It's Canon 188, number 4. It talks about the tacit resignation from, your, from an office. Tacit meaning it's, it's given. It's a given thing. They use the word ipso facto, meaning this is an automatic thing. Ipso facto, by the fact itself, and it says, without declaration, without a need of a declaration. And it goes to this, that, and that. Number four is a public defection from the faith. Now, how this ties in with your question about does canon law make references? Yes, it does. Most of you, if you get a canon law book, you're going to be looking at an English version. That's good. But if you look at it in the Latin, the original Latin, it's going to have footnotes. And those footnotes are basically telling you where they got those laws from. And I would just say, this is where a lot of people go astray. Because they don't understand the principles of law. And that's before we even dig into the 2,414 laws. Before we get into that with the seminarians, we talk about principles of law. There's a big, thick book by uh, Archbishop Sikinani because he, he very eruditely talks about the principles of law. But how do we understand this 1917 code? The 1917 code says, if the 17 code repeats the old law, if you want to know how to interpret the law of 1917, and it's based on the old law, go back to the old law. Read the source, the Pope or whoever, the Council of the Church. Read that. That's the interpretation. To the degree that something's not in this 1917 code, if it's not here, then it's no longer a law. But if it's here but only in part, then you go back to the original and see where it, where it is in part and interpret it exactly the way it was written a long time ago. Now with the canon 28 number 4, what's the footnote? in the Latin text. Cum ex apostolatus of Paul the 4th, 1559. That's the reference for this right here. So when people say, oh, this don't, this don't, this don't, it's not in there anymore. This is the law. This is the source of it. You want to interpret it this way, you got to go to here. And it's saying that you can't elect a heretic. A heretic cannot be elected a pope. So I really want to get into... Uh, the, the meat of the matter about the papacy because that's the primary confusions today. We've got a lot of different areas that we want to talk about. Any more questions though? Yes? I believe that all that we find in sacred scripture is all that God wants us to know. And if there are any things that are not in sacred scripture, see, that's our guarantee. We have what we call public revelation, what God has revealed to us and to all mankind. Sacred scripture and tradition, that is, where, that is what God wants us to know, and that's what we must follow. There's a lot of private revelation out there, and technically speaking, private revelation, we're not bound to it. The church has approved, like Fatima, La Salette, Lourdes. Those are private revelations. The church says that you may f- safely believe these things. You wouldn't be a heretic if you said, I didn't believe Our Lady appeared at Fatima. You would be wanting and, 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 and being in- incredulous for there's such clear evidence that Our Lady appeared there. But you wouldn't be a heretic for denying that. But what God wants us to know is all there clearly spelled out in, in Scripture. Now, all these other extra things... I think we just have to be very careful, and that's why we want to be objective and very careful not to go off into tangents. I'll give you one example. Uh, There used to be this book called The Bible Code, and 
you know, was, uh, was all dealing with numbers. So if if they supposedly said, now if you look at these these passages here and you count these numbers and you do this code, then it's going to talk about John F. Kennedy being assassinated. I'm like, what? You know, oh yeah, yeah. So there's a whole book written on this. And you know what? I said, what a deceit of the devil. Read what the scriptures say and don't be looking for some hidden message because you're going to miss explicitly what's being revealed by God of how we're supposed to live. So, that, you know, things like Bible code and other things, I just, just stay away from that. Yes? Well, yes, but I would have to say this. We make a distinction between divine truths and legislation so if something contains legislation that's changeable it's it's the laws of the church are only infallible in a sense that the church can never propose to our practice or legislate say you have to do this have to do that can never propose to us something that's contrary to faith and morals or that lead to our damnation but laws can change but this cum ex apostolatus is saying a heretic can't be elected pope that's, that's God's law. That's divine law. That's not a legislational thing that, oh, that, that ended in 1917. That's not true. Well, yes, but I would say with, quote, yes, there's, there's a lot of papal bulls that end with that type of thing. But the point is, is that if it's dealing with legislation, you know, Jesus said to St. Peter, whatever you bind under it's bound in heaven, whatever you loose under it's loose in heaven. So if it's legislation, that can be changed. Now, I would just say with regard to like the Mass, the De Defectibus, which says, you know, these are the words of consecration, this is the matter and the, and the, the form of the sacraments, that can't be changed. Uh, I'll give you a really good example of this. this is, um, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here, but this. When John Paul II was supposedly the Pope, Cardinal Rattinger, who was in charge of the, this, this office for the, you know, the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith, they issued a statement about a schismatic group called the Assyrian Church of the East. And you could look it up on the Vatican website, type in Assyrian Church of the East. John Paul II approved what Cardinal Rattinger and his office approved, which was that their mass was valid. The problem with this quote-unquote mass was that it doesn't have a consecration. There's no words of consecration at the Mass. And yet they said that's a valid Mass and Catholics who can't go anywhere else can go to that Mass. That is absolutely preposterous. You, can, you, don't, have no, you don't have a consecration, you don't have a Mass. Now, later on you read Cardinal Rattinger, supposedly Cardinal Rattinger, who is this, you know, the bulldog of orthodoxy. He was saying, you know, some people get all wrapped up at words. You know, they get all hung up on words, like words. It's not words, it's the community. You know what? That is, that is so, that isn't even close. I mean, not even close. And, and that's why we have to be objective. The man can wear a white cassock and live in the Vatican, come out and wave his hands to everybody and go in the Pope Mobile and everybody goes cheering. But if he's saying that a mass is valid, that has no consecration, I'm sorry, that's not the teaching of sacramental theology. That's not the teachings of Christ. The, the church is very clear. Council of Trent, and especially Pope Pius XII, explicitly said this in Sacramentum Ordinis. The church has no authority over the substance of the sacraments. Those things instituted by Christ cannot be changed. John Paul II also approved of using uh, a cava root for bread and some other type of wine uh, for the mass, that's an invalid matter. You can't. He can't change that. Christ, when he offered at the Last Supper, you know, he changed the bread and wine to his own body and blood. It was unleavened wheat bread and grape wine. Period. The church has no authority over that. So when these men say, "Oh, you can go ahead and use kava root, or you can use that, or you don't have to have words of consecration," I don't, don't, don't get hung up on words. Don't worry about it. That is that's crazy. When they stand up and tell people. Yeah, we should worship with other, other churches, other religions. The Holy Spirit's active beyond the Catholic Church. And, and the Holy Ghost is active and present in all the religions of the world. I mean, it's my gosh. Do, am I hearing what I'm hearing? Yes, you are hearing what you're hearing. It's, it's absolutely preposterous. 
uh, the new code of canon law, which John Paul II, and we want to touch upon him a little bit because, quote, unquote, he's going to be canonized. In 1983, the new code of canon law, canon 843, says you can give communion to non-Catholics. The conditions, they can't get to their own minister. So it's not that they're converting. They can't get to their own minister. Number two, they're in urgent need. They really need. Number three, they believe in that sacrament. Now, let, let's just suppose this for a second. Let's say a Lutheran wants to go to communion and he can't get to his own minister. And he says, I believe in the Eucharist, but he believes in divorce with remarriage. He believes that, as what Luther said, be a sinner and sin boldly, but just believe more boldly still. And he can't help it, but he's a sinner. And he commits mortal sin, but he believes in Jesus, so he's saved. And we're going to give this man communion? He's not even a member of the church. Now, John Paul II, after he did that, he took it a step further. You always, you know, throw it out as a trial balloon. Nobody complains about it. Let's go a step further. Uh, in the book uh, booklet, the, the Pope speaks. You know, about ten years later, John Paul II says, "When there's a mixed marriage between a Catholic and a non-Catholic, a Eucharistic sharing with a non-Catholic is possible. You can give communion to a non-Catholic." So, you know, it's like this: you just give here a little bit there, and before you know it, the rot, the cancer spreads throughout the entire body. Was there any other questions? Because I want to get back to this subject.